whatsoever, but we just believe that Wednesday nights is important for us to just get a faith injection, amen, and get the Word of God to encourage us and strengthen us through the week. And so we just encourage that. We know we've got several on vacation. We want to be praying for them that God would just keep them safe as well. Amen? Praise God. Look at your neighbor. Tell them I'm glad you made it tonight. All right. Let's stand together and worship the Lord. Amen. And then we're, we're just going to go into our worship here this evening. Father, we thank you for this privilege tonight that we have to come and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, God, that you have encouraged us this week and you have given us strength and you have empowered us and you have met every need and God we give you praise and glory for that and we just ask you tonight God as we enter into this place to lift up your name and to worship you we pray God with our praise and our worship that we will create an atmosphere that is conducive for your word and for your presence and for your power to flow into our lives and God that you will challenge us that you will change us that you will transform us by your glory and by your power tonight, we give you praise and thanks for it in the marvelous name of Jesus. And amen, amen. Praise God. Let's worship the Lord together tonight. God is on our side, we won't be afraid. Though the mountains may fall and the skies will crumble, there ain't nothing gonna stand in our way. Come on down to the riverside and wash it all away. Leave behind your troubled mind for an uncloudy day When nothing's gonna separate us from the Father's love Well, I can't help but celebrate Because we're not alone God is on our side Who can be against us If God is on our side We won't be Though the mountains may fall and the skies will crumble, but there ain't nothing gonna stand in our way. If God is on our side, who can be against us? If God is on our side, we won't be afraid. Though the mountains may fall and the skies will crumble where there ain't nothing gonna stand in our way come on down to the riverside wash it all away leave behind your troubled mind for an uncloudy day nothing's gonna separate us from the father's love well, I can't help but celebrate Because we're not alone and God is on our side Who can be against us If God is on our side We won't be afraid Though the mountains may fall And the skies will crumble There ain't nothing gonna stand in our way God is on our side, who can be against us? If God is on our side, we won't be afraid. Though the mountains may fall and the skies will 
crumble when there ain't nothing gonna stand in our way. God is on our side. Who can be against us? God is on our side. We won't be afraid. Though the mountains may fall and the sky will crumble, but there ain't nothing gonna stand our way.
God. Aren't you glad nothing is impossible with Him? Amen. Praise God. You may be seated for just a moment. Our ushers will be waiting upon you tonight for your giving. And, uh, so as you just prepare there, let me uh, read just a couple of scriptures here this evening. In uh, last Wednesday night, we started a series entitled Generational Blessing and uh, Generational Flow. And uh, we finished, continued on Sunday, and we'll be continuing again this coming Sunday on that. But in Luke chapter 1, verse 46, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has regard the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations, say all generations, will call me blessed for he who is mighty has done great things for me from generation to generation amen the whole excuse me he said for me the whole and holy is his name and his mercy is the on those who fear him from generation to generation praise God how many know today that God blesses from generation to generation a lot of folks say, well, there's, yeah, there, a lot of folks would say that revival is coming through the young generation, and I believe they'll have a part in it, but I submit to you there will not be a, gener a revival unless there is a multi-generational group coming together, and in that multi-generation, we'll see a revival that the gates of hell cannot stop. Amen? Praise God. We need everybody in the kingdom. So we need everybody in the kingdom. Every generation and every time that God chose to bless in a great way, he always addressed himself in multi-generational God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Whenever you look in the scripture and you see that he announces that, get ready, he's about to blow their minds. Amen. And I'm telling you that we're on the brink, we're, we're on at the tipping point of something, not only in this church, but the body of Christ, that we are ready to see something significant shift and take place in the body, and we've got to bring the generations together. Amen. Now, let me just read another scripture in Joel 3 and 19. Egypt shall be a desolate, and Edom desolate wilderness, because of violence against the people of Judah. For they have shed innocent blood in their land, but Judah shall abide forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. Praise God. And so he is a multi-generational God, and we're going to continue to visit that on Sunday. Tonight I just want to remind you as you prepare for your giving that uh, we will be having celebrating our ministry teams here this coming Sunday. Also, Restore More Oklahoma. We're teaming up with several churches and doing that. And we want you to have all of your things here by June the 15th. You can bring them in during the day. The office is open from uh, 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And so you can bring those in. We need shovels. We need rakes. We need tarps. We need uh, all kinds of tools. Uh, you know, we can take cases of water, but not a whole lot of food items. And we're going to go there and bless those people and show the love of God, all right? Amen. And so help us with that. Now, tomorrow night at Giovanni's in uh, Milton, there on Route 60, they will be giving 10% uh, of the, uh, their sales to the missions here uh, at the church for the, uh, the Honduras trip. And so we, uh, if you are going to uh, be eating out tomorrow evening, go down there and uh, buy something and then it'll be a blessing to you and it'll be a blessing to those in Honduras. We're going to be going there in October, so it's going to be a great time, all right? Praise God. Everybody happy tonight? Amen. Amen. All right. Father, thank you for this privilege tonight to give. Thank you for kingdom work. Thank you for people that have a heart, God, to just do the kingdom work. And we just ask you tonight that you continue to bless the gift and the giver supplying every need, not only of this house, but every house connected to this house. And God, we give you praise and thanks for this in Jesus' name. And amen. Amen. God bless you as you give tonight.
Praise God. All right, it's good to have Pastor and Sister Wright with us tonight. I'm sorry, I didn't even see you standing there to just a moment or sitting there to just a moment ago. It's good to have you with us tonight. Amen. I've asked Brother Jimmy if he would to share the word with us tonight. I'm going to take a little break this evening. Is that okay? If it's not, I'm on to anyhow. All right. Okay, Brother Jimmy, come and share the word. Would you give the Lord a good God bless you for Brother Jimmy? Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. And you know what? I, I appreciate this church. I love being here. I love that this is my home church. And, you know, I was thinking today, um, I, I, I've been here just uh, right over a year now. And, and I remember uh, we grew up uh, Baptist, and then we went through the word of faith and, uh, you know, felt God uh, calling us into this organization. And, and so we searched around. I, I called Bishop Wicker, and uh, he had given me some names. He said, go and search out some of these churches. And uh, different places, and he gave me Bishop uh, Brian's name and, uh, you know, a few other ones around, and, and I came here first because it was the closest one, and I never left. I called Bishop Wicker back and, and asked him, I said, man, Bishop, do I have to go anywhere else, or can I just stay put if, if he'll have me, and uh, he told me I could stay as long as uh, Bishop Matthews, and I say that because I, I love my pastor, I love my bishop, he's, he's my mentor, he's my life coach, he's He's my spiritual father, and, and I appreciate the opportunity, Bishop, to, to have your pulpit tonight. Amen. I appreciate my first lady as well. I don't want to leave you out. I love you very much. Uh, but tonight, I'm just going to uh, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, teaching tonight. Uh, teaching meaning explanation and, and not preaching, proclaiming. Um, always a little bit of preaching, you so you never know <laughs> what will happen. But uh, I've been... Uh, this is my new, in, in my professional life, I'm a salesman, and uh, June 1st starts over our, uh, our new fiscal year. So every year I try to read uh, some kind of business book or business-minded book, and uh, the one I'm reading now has just, uh, it's messed me up, and it's a secular book, but everything that he's teaching is biblical principles. And the man's not a Christian, the man's, the man's just a businessman, he's a, he's a good businessman, and everything that he does when you read this, I get excited because I see scriptural, spiritual, biblical principles. And I sit there thinking, if this man who doesn't have a covenant with God can be successful in every area of his life because of the word of God, because he's operating in the principles of, of giving and receiving, sowing and reaping, uh, confession, uh, right thinking, right attitudes, if he's operating in all of those things, yet he doesn't have a covenant with God, how much more can the body of Christ be blessed in every single area of our lives knowing that we've got a covenant with a creator of the universe we our God owns the cattle on a thousand hill our God walks on streets of gold our God created our body and is also our healer of our body our God is the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end if you're born again if you've received the Holy Spirit you've got the helper the 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 one who will go right beside you and live and should not won't just be with you but shall be in you the very helper the standby the go-between the Holy Spirit of God helping us and aiding us and reminding us of all the things Jesus said and, and becoming there right up beside us how much more should the body of Christ operate in the blessing of the Lord in every area of our lives man the world is operating under uh, and receiving because they put into law and into motion the, the laws of giving receiving confession and all those things and it works for them but it doesn't work in the church very often I'll tell you why, because we're not taking the principles of the word and putting them in operation in our lives. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, just some real basic stuff, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about soul salvation. Soul salvation. And I just want to start in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. The Bible says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. A little bit of foundation, God has created mankind in his image. The word image means a, a replica. It means uh, one who was molded after. I drive in the parking lot right now a Nissan Rogue. That is a Nissan Rogue. It is equal with the Nissan Rogue that's on the showroom floor right now, but it is a replica of the original. 
when they, when they got in their mind and their imagination, we're going to build a car and we're going to call it the, the, the Nissan, uh, you know, the Nissan Rogue, they put it down on paper. They imagined it. They had it in their mind. They put it down on paper. They created one in, in the physical. They put one together. They put it through tests. They put it through different practices. They, they checked its full fuel efficiency. They checked its safety rating. They checked its horsepower. They did everything. And when they perfected it, they decided that we are now going to make this in our own image. Image, in the image of the original, we are going to mass produce the same thing over and over and over again. And that's what God has done to the body of Christ. Mankind was made in his image, in his exact replica. God is spirit. Now, he is spirit. The Bible says, and I'm going to go uh, quickly through some of these scriptures. I uh, could have pulled a lot of them, so just make some notes if you want to uh, uh, follow along. Um, God is spirit. John chapter 4, 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God's not a spirit. God is spirit. God is spirit. God is life. God is spirit. Now, uh, also, God has a soul. Now, your soul, by definition, is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And I want to read just a few scriptures here, just kind of pointing some of these things out. Lots of scriptures. But concerning the mind of God, the Bible says in Isaiah 55 and 8, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. How interesting. God thinks. God says, The thoughts that I have are not like the thoughts that you have. So God has a realm in which he thinks. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Again, God thinks. He has developed thoughts and has a thought life and a pattern of thinking and observing and distinguishing thoughts and, and processing information. He has thoughts toward you and I. He has a thought uh, for the pattern that your life is supposed to be in. He has a thought and a destiny and a purpose for your life and for my life. God thinks about you. God thinks. He's got a thought life. He's got a thought realm. Uh, his will, this is a little long, but it's so awesome. In, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 12, listen to what the Bible says. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in himself before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. How? According to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. So those of us who are born again, he's revealed to us the mystery of his will. How? According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we who first trusted in Christ should be praise of his glory. God has a will. That's only one place. There are many places. It says, pray without ceasing. Always be thankful. For in being thankful in all things, that is the will of God. God has a will. He's got a purpose. I don't understand everything there is to understand about grace. I know that it works. I don't understand everything there is to know about salvation and things like that. But I know how we got it because of his will. He decided this is how it's going to be. This is what's going to please me for this to happen. In Isaiah 53, it says that it pleased the father to bruise the son. All right? Not necessarily that he wanted his son to, to be gone, but it pleased him because he says, I am pleased that this will be the redemptive work of my son that will bring you and I, fallen sinful man, back to a holy, righteous God. God has a will. He's got a purpose. He decides some things are just 
what they are just because he decided that's what he wanted. The sky is blue. You can call it whatever you want to call it. You can do whatever you want to do to the sky. And the sky will be blue. If you hate blue, it doesn't matter. You'll wake up tomorrow. You'll look up. You'll see a blue sky because God decided it's my will that the sky is blue. Nothing can change that order. Nothing can change that law. Nothing can change that principle. The sky will be blue forever because of his will. He decided this is how it's going to be. Amen. He's got a will. The interesting thing is the Bible says that he's made known to me and you the mystery of his will. So you and I, the Bible says we know his will. Oh, now come on, because I'm going a little bit somewhere with that, because well, I just don't know the will of God. Well, the Bible says that we have the opportunity to know the mystery of the will of God. The Bible says I can know the will of God for my life. But it's all over the body of Christ, man. So many people, well, I just don't know what the will of God is. Well, the Bible says that you and I can know the will of the Father. He's, it's not a mystery to you and I anymore. It's available to you and I. It's put out there. We can find the will of God, not only for our life as a believer, but on our personal, individual life. God doesn't withhold any good thing from us. God has a will for us, and we can know his will. The last thing is, and I, I've got three short verses, emotions. It says uh, in 1 Kings 11 and 9, the Bible says, So the Lord God became angry when, with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. In Psalms 149 and 4, the Bible says, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. The last one is Genesis 6 and 6. It says, And the Lord God was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. All right. Soul. God has thoughts. He's got a mind. God has a will. God has emotions. There are tons of emotions that you'll read of God having throughout the Bible. Last one, I'm just laying, this is my foundation, and I'll get into this. God has a body. We all know John 1, 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ has a body, right? Real simple. He has a body. He gave His body up for you and I. Amen. But listen to this. I found this interesting. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 16, 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord. So God has eyes. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking to show himself strong on behalf of those who heart, whose heart is loyal to him. God has eyes that's looking for a faithful, loyal heart. God has eyes that's searching through the world. He's not searching for perfection. He's not searching for everyone that's got all their stuff lined up. He's looking for someone with a heart that's loyal unto him. David messed up all the time. David did some things that I haven't done, right? He's done some things that you haven't done. But he had a loyal heart toward God. He was quick to repent, quick to come into God's presence, quick to say that God was good in his life. Um, the Bible says this in Exodus 24 and 10. It says, And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. So God has a body. Bible will talk different places. The hand of the Lord was stretched out. Heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. We know that God has a body. We know Jesus was the word made flesh. And that is my foundation tonight to get to the topic of soul salvation. Now, God is spirit. We've established that. God has a soul. God, Jesus, has a body, right? You and I were made in the image, in the replica of God. That will never change. Every person that's born walking on this earth falls into this category. You are a spirit. That's who you are. Who you really are is spirit. Inside of you, inside of me, that's why if I would die right now, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My body will be here. You all will come and look at it. Some of you will cry. Some of you will laugh. Uh, but my body will remain, but I won't be here because who I really am is spirit. The Bible says that when God breathed into man, he became a living soul. The word soul there is spirit. It means life. It's not psyche. It's life. He became life. The spirit of God. Man is spirit, but attached to our spirit is a soul. 
It's separate from, one, from, from the Spirit, but it's also intertwined and connected to the Spirit. In your soul is your mind, your thoughts, your will, and your emotions. And all of us who are born on this earth have a body. Okay? Now here's the interesting thing about the spirit, soul, and body. When you become born again, your spirit man is regenerated or regenerated, right? You, your spirit man becomes one with God. Your spirit man is saved. Your spirit man is forgiven. Your flesh is not saved. Your flesh is not forgiven. But neither is your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, right? That's why when some of us got saved, we began to get in, get in, in doubt and, and think, you know, wonder about things. And some of the old soul thoughts and stuff we had would still come up to us as soon as we were saved. Right? So we are a spirit. We possess a soul. We live in a body. Here's the interesting thing about your soul realm, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your soul realm is the only thing that connects the spiritual world in your life to the physical world in your life. That's your, your soul realm is the only thing that has really experienced uh, tangibly the pleasures of the flesh and the pleasures of the spirit. That's why when sometimes you hear the, a, a song and it brings back maybe the song that played the day you were born again and you hear that song and for you that's a trigger to you. So you, in, inside man you get excited and you get joyous and you get happy and, and that comes from your spirit. Your spirit's rejoicing through the emotions of your soul and it's coming out through physical display through your body. But also when you were a sinner and you had pleasure in the flesh your soul participated in the pleasure of your flesh. And so why am I saying all this? Because we are spirit, soul, and body. And Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In other words, our spirit are in our born-again state will always go after the things of God. My spirit is saved, it's born again, it's regenerated. It wants to side with the word, it wants to side with the light, it wants to side with God, it wants to go toward Jesus. My flesh is not saved. My flesh wants to go toward the sin and the darkness and, and, and the things of the world. My flesh is, is, it wants the pleasure of the old man. It's the flesh that rises up. Man, the flesh wants to chew somebody out and, and give them the number one sign when they cut you off in traffic. Man, that's your flesh. Your flesh wants to rise up and, and punch your boss and, and sometimes in your mind cuss them out and things like that. That's not your spirit. That's your flesh. But your spirit wants to bless those who curse you. Your spirit wants to tell them, guys, you don't have to live this way. Let me lead you to Jesus. Your spirit is always willing for the things of God. Your flesh is always disobedient and diswilling for the things of God. That means in every decision of life, there is a three-member vote. Your spirit will always vote with the way of God. Your flesh will always vote the way of your world. And so the deciding vote in every instance in your life will come through your mind, through your thoughts, through your will, and through your emotions. It will come through your soul. That's why it's so important, man, that we got our mind right and got our soul right. That's why we got to get in the Word and get our, our thinking right. Because every decision we make, the, the winner of that decision, whether it's God or whether it's flesh, whether it's your spirit or whether it's your flesh, the decision will be made by whatever the way that your soul casts its vote. The way that your mind has thought on the situation will tell you to walk in victory or to walk in defeat. Your mind, your soul will tell you to either walk in faith or to walk in unbelief. Your soul will remind you of the word of God or it will remind you of your present current situation. Your soul is what ties those things that are in the spirit and brings it manifest into our physical. It, that's how it happens. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus in Mark 11 says this. He says, have faith in God. For I say unto you, whoever prays and believes they've received, they shall have whatsoever they say. Now why is this important? Because in your soul realm, you will develop thoughts, right? When your thoughts stay there and you continue to ponder and think on things, it becomes a stronghold inside of you. It becomes something that cannot be shaken. It becomes just a way of life. We call it lifestyles and personality traits, but really it's not. It's a soul tie. 
it's either good or bad, but it's something you've downloaded into your thoughts, your will, and your emotions. And so what happens is when something comes up and rises against you, your soul will decide which way you go. And so Jesus said, you're going to have whatever you say. Whatever you think in your mind is what will come out of your mouth. I've got scripture for it. The Bible says, out of the abundance of a man's heart. That's what comes out of his mouth. His mouth speaks. If you listen to someone long enough, you'll know where they are in life. I can spend five minutes with you and tell if you're going to be successful or tell if you're going to be destroyed. And it's by what comes out of your mouth. Because you can put on an act and change some different things and, and put on a pretty face. But if you let someone talk long enough, man, it's, it's, it, you let someone talk long enough, you know what's in their heart. As a salesman, they teach me this one thing. That if, uh, the best salesmen ever are the ones who shut up and don't say nothing. <laughs> they don't. Man, you ever see someone, some car salesman coming up to you and just jabbering his jaws? Man, you might as well go on because he don't know what he's talking about. Why is that important? Because he has understood that if I am quiet and I allow you to speak, I can now begin to know where your heart is. I know what your triggers are. I know if you're ready to buy. I know if you're concerned about safety, if you're concerned about gas efficiency, or if you're concerned about performance, or if you're going through a midlife crisis and have to have, you know, the, 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 the cars like the kids, right? Nothing against that, but he listens, right? He listens to that. And so when you begin to listen to someone, out of their heart is what will be, out of their mouth is what's in their heart. And what's in their heart will tell you how their mind is, what's in their mind, where their thinking is, right? Man, you know, it's funny when you minister to people, it becomes funny because they'll say things like, well, I'm standing on the word, I'm believing the word, I'm speaking the word, I'm praying the word, and we know the word works. But then they'll ask, but what do you do when the word doesn't work? Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth just spoke that the word doesn't work. So somewhere in your heart, you don't really believe that the word works for you in every situation. Oh, you believe that it works for others. I'm not saying you deny the power of God. I'm not saying that we deny that God can do it. But I'm saying you deny the fact that God has done it, hath already done it for you. That he wants you blessed. That he wants you healed. That he wants you to walk in peace and joy. God wants that for you. But what happens is we get all messed up in our soul realm and see what we'll do is we'll quote these pretty scriptures that we've learned. Well, by his stripes I am healed. And we'll stand it and we'll look pretty and we'll say those things until the sickness, the disease, the oppression comes. And then you get around that person and you'll know within five minutes what they really believe in their heart. Because it's not about saying the right things. Can I tell you how you become born again and how faith becomes activated in your life? You can't just be saying the right things, and you can't just be thinking the right things. The Bible says that salvation comes by this. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, right? And the Bible says that uh, a man must believe unto righteousness, and then confession is made unto salvation. If your words aren't lining up with what's in your heart, you can't have what's coming out of your mouth. But if your heart's not lining up with what's coming out of your mouth, you can't have what's coming out of your mouth either. We've got to get our soul realm, our thoughts, our mind, our will, and our emotion lined up with what is coming out of our mouth. Because listen, man, that's how the kingdom of God is released and operated. You can stand there all day long and quote scripture. There are men today who are going to hell that can quote more scripture than I probably can. But it has become a letter of the law to them. In their heart, they have not accepted the truth of the word. They have not embraced it. They have not put it in their heart. So they can say whatever they want to say. But if it doesn't line up with the heart, their words are, are, are of none effect. And so we can say, well, we want to be a church of 500. We can say that with our mouth all day long. But our, our words and our actions will line up with what our heart really says. Because that's the way humans operate. Your thought life, man, between your ears is where your biggest battle will ever be. It can't be from the enemy coming against you because greater is he that's in me than he that's, that's in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. So it can't be an attack of the enemy. The Bible says in Colossians that the enemy has been disarmed and, and, and all principalities and powers have been disarmed and they're under the authority of Jesus, right? I'm in Christ. So it can't be an attack of the enemy that's my biggest struggle. 
My biggest struggle is the mind that's between my ears. Because, listen, the way that the devil comes against a born-again believer isn't necessarily through any other way than through your mind. Because he knows that we have the authority now that he lost. We've got the authority of Christ. And so if he begins to get in our mind and get our thoughts messed up, he'll get our mouth messed up and he'll get our actions messed up. And if you look at your life where you are right now, if you trace it back, it is a direct result of your words and your thoughts and your actions because what you think becomes an emotion and whatever your emotion is becomes an action and whatever your action is gives you the results amen what happens is is we begin to judge fruit and the things on the surface right so what we do is we'll look at a tree and we'll say well this tree isn't really producing much fruit for me this apple tree so what we'll do and, and, and what most people do is they'll go out and they observe the fruit I only see two apples on my tree my tree is not producing for me. And so they'll be upset. I don't know why there's not more fruit. And they go around all day talking about the fruit. And they'll call up their, 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 hand, their, their green thumb friends and ask them, Man, what do I do to get more fruit? How come your tree has more fruit? My tree, man, it's, it, my tree should have as much fruit as your head. So everyone's focusing on the fruit. But the problem isn't within the fruit. The problem is always within somewhere in the root. The problem with the tree is always really underneath the surface. It's the thing that you can't see. Your heart will always determine the fruitfulness of your life. Your heart is determined by the thoughts that you and I have in our mind and the things that we ponder on, right? And so what we're doing is we're looking at people's fruit. And listen, I'm not saying that we don't, uh, can, can I say we don't judge people, but we do judge spirits? Is that okay to say? I don't judge a person necessarily, but I do judge a spirit, and, and I do judge uh, what, you know, uh, but all the time what I'm trying to say is this, is what we'll do is we'll say, well, real condescendingly so often, I don't judge them, but I sure do. God has called me to be a fruit inspector. <laughs> right? Come on, man. Yeah, I know you've heard it. Man, God's called me to be a fruit inspector, and it ain't lining up right and so what you begin to do is you're looking at the person's fruit right so you're calling up your friends and you're calling up your neighbors and you're talking about the people and you're spreading gossip and you're spreading rumors and now you're mad at that person and you can't won't take your eyes and your focus off of their fruit see you become a fruit inspector and God wants us to be root inspectors See, God wants you to go in brotherly love and say, man, listen, what your theology, what you're thinking is wrong. God is good all the time. God always causes me to triumph. God has blessed me and not cursed me. Man, I, if you begin to get in the Word, you begin to cringe on the inside when someone misrepresents or misspeaks God. Right? Um, well, God must have taken them home early because he needed another angel. <laughs> I'm not an angel. <laughs> They're not an angel either. Listen, I'm not saying that situations in life doesn't happen, but what I'm telling you is the only reason you base that is because somewhere you've got a wrong thought in your head and it's not truth. And anything that's not of faith is a sin. Amen? And so that's why we're so messed up. We have a soul. We are a spirit that has a soul. Right? We live in a body. The, uh, let me give this example real quickly. It's, it's, it teaches us the power of our thoughts. A husband and wife almost got divorced. Um, they had been married for about 12 years and couldn't get along and uh, almost ended their marriage. And uh, come to find out the biggest thing that they fought about was money. So they went and they began to think about this. And, and see, so we all look religious, but we've all had these conversations, right? And, and so, you know, money's a big deal. Man, if someone tells you money doesn't matter, yes, it does matter. Money does matter. It does, and that's the number one leading cause of divorce, both in Christian homes and, and in, in America and around the world, is money. And so it's amazing. They began to go to counseling and, and things like that, and, and it was a great counselor, man, good Christian counselor they went to, and uh, they began to talk about their past life with money, right? And so this woman goes, and um, she's talking, and it's amazing because she says, this is what I remember about money growing up. She says, I remember growing up and when uh, I hear the ice cream truck, I'd run to my mommy and I'd ask her for a quarter so I could go buy me an ice cream cone. Well, she'd go to her mom and her mom told her, honey, women don't ever have the money. Your, your daddy men always hold the money. And so, I didn't say that. I'm repeating this story, so don't be mad at me about that. 
but listen, she would go to her daddy. Her daddy would give her the quarter. She would take the quarter to the ice cream man. He would give her the ice cream. She would give him the quarter. Two things developed in her thought life. They weren't her thoughts. They were passed down to her from someone else. Two things. Number one, a woman can never have money and shouldn't ever have money. That's a thought she developed. I, I know it's funny, but I mean, man, this is serious. She developed that thought. The second thing she developed was this, is that money is pleasure. Well, money's not pleasure. Money can buy you pleasure, but money's not pleasure. Her husband grew up differently. His dad was a builder. So he, what his dad would do is his dad would go out and he'd buy up property and go in massive debt. He'd buy a bunch of land, build a bunch of houses, and spend the next couple of years selling off the property and the houses, right? And so when he would do that, they would be poor for two or three years, and then they'd be rich and very prosperous for two or three years. So he got tired of being poor in the, between those times, so he developed a thought in his life, money is security. Well, money is not security. Money is money. Money can provide peace and security sometimes, but money is not security. And so he, in his mind, he developed the thought that money is security. Now, isn't this just a messed up couple to get together with those two different backgrounds, right? Because she would go and she equated money as pleasure. And she also was taught women can't have money. So if you gave that woman $10, if you gave her $10,000, she's coming home with nothing, Jack. She's not coming home with anything. Women can't hold on to money. She's doing this subconsciously. She doesn't even know she's doing it. She's not planning this out. She's coming back broke as a joke, spending every dime she has because money buys her pleasure and women can't hold on to money. And so he, on the other hand, is a hoarder because money is security. And so he's holding on to the money. So she goes to him, husband, can I have the money to go buy new shoes? He says, no. She gets mad at him because he's taking away her pleasure because money to her is pleasure. So she takes money anyway and goes and buys three pairs of new shoes instead of the one. And he's mad at her because she's taking away his security. She wasn't taking away his security. He wasn't taking away her pleasure they had a bad thought life that developed everything else in their life. Man, that is the power of the thought realm in your life. Your biggest problems are going to come under the surface in the way that you are thinking, in the thoughts that you are meditating on, on the things that you think on. So what do we do? What do, we do? The Bible tells us, it says uh, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now how are we going to do that as the body of Christ? I mean, really, how are we going to do that, talking about how messed up our flesh is and some of our thoughts are wrong and all this? Well, he tells you in verse 2, he says, don't be conformed to the world. Don't, you're, you weren't made to replicate the world. You were made to replicate me. So be transformed from what you, what you were into my image. How? By renewing your mind. He said you're going to have to start thinking on other things, and it's going to start in your mind. You're going to have to think on things. The Bible says in John 6, 63, it says, uh, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. So listen, what Jesus says there is this, is we see two things. We see number one, that your only way out to be in, your, in our situation is to begin to change our thought life and change our thought pattern, right? We're going to have to change the way we're thinking. How do we change the way we're thinking? We've got to put something else before our eyes. It's, it's, it's like reprogramming a uh, software in your brain. You've got to get your mind off of things that you grew up. Listen, man, I, when I say I grew up Baptist, I grew up old school Baptist, okay? Meaning if a woman wore pants in church, she wasn't allowed in. Are you, I mean, are you hearing? I mean, man, we're talking, we're talking bad. Women do not testify. They do not sing. They're allowed to teach our little children, and that's it. Because women should be under the men's feet, right? And, and I grew up seeing those things. Well, you know what's awful is, is later on in, when I first got saved, man, that's all I knew. So I began to do that to my own wife. I did. I began to try to push her down because I felt like this is what's right. But guess what? I was wrong. How did I change? I, I got in the Word and I said, "My, there ain't no one else treating women like that in the Bible. 
So I began to get in the Word, and I began to change. I, I, I found a, a place where someone, I went in, I'll never forget, when I, the first time I went to a Word of Faith church from the Baptist, uh, and, and I accidentally, uh, well, not accidentally, but uh, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and was asked to leave the uh, Baptist church and uh, went to a Word of Faith church. And, and the interesting thing, my first time there, and, and I believe with all my heart it was a God thing, uh, the pastor, uh, pastor's wife, uh, she preached that night, and I'm, oh my goodness, what have I gotten into? Because I still had these thoughts, right? They were ingrained in me. They became my personality, and I would fight you over it. You could not change my mind from because this is the way. How do you know? Man, I was raised right. I'm a King James only, hymnal only, singing, choir, robe wearing. I mean, man, this is who we were, right? Man, we don't, we don't even have a baptistry, man. We went out to the rivers, the creeks, and things like that because we weren't bringing the world into our church. <laughs> you know? I mean, really, man, that's how I was raised. And so it took me a while. So what? I had to get around other people, and I had to begin to get in the Word. And I, I had to decide, listen, I've got to make a decision and do something in my mind. I can continue to go the way that I've always been taught, or I can find it in the Word. And the amazing thing is when I began to get in the Word, not only did I find that was an incorrect thought, but I also found out that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not of the devil. I didn't get a bad spirit, right? I learned that tithing isn't just a law thing. It's not just an Old Testament thing. So as I began to see these things that, that, that were different and came against my theology and my thinking, I had to begin to change myself and change my thoughts. So I would go and take this, these scriptures, and I would put them before me, and I, every day I would meditate on the Word. I'd pull over from my job. I'd, I'd pull over on that, and that's what I did, man. I stuck with the Word. The same thing over and over and over and over again. And I didn't even perceive the change within my life. Others began to tell me about it because it seemed like such a slow process to me. But others would begin to say, man, you're a lot kinder to your wife now. They noticed right I mean people know this and I don't even live with them I thought I put on a pretty good front for two hours on Sunday right but even they could tell the, the way that the way I, I put my you know put things on and things like that they could tell I was kinder they could tell that I wasn't legalistic and, and the amazing thing is, is is as a Baptist we were taught you know once once in grace always in grace but we hated everybody <laughs> I mean, you know everything was a sin you couldn't do nothing when I was growing up right but we were taught, man, ain't nothing you can do to lose. I, you know, so I had to get in the Word. I had to find out for myself what the Scripture says. The Bible says in Joshua 1 it says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you will observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will, uh, will make your ways prosperous, and you will have good success. The Bible tells us that the way to a prosperous life, the way to a changed life, is when we begin to meditate on the Word. I'm almost finished. Uh, you come and get us a, a song to play for us real quickly. I've got two more scriptures and I am going to turn it off. <clears throat> In James chapter 1 verses 19 through 26, it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow the wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The word soul here um, is psyche. It means your mind, your will, and your emotions. The word, the implanted word is able to save your soul. And he says there, but be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Last scripture, and then I just want to say a couple of closing things. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're not fleshly, but they're mighty in God. Listen, for the pulling down of strongholds, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. My favorite part right here. 
bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. This is why I wanted to read those scriptures back to back. Because your answer is in the Word of God. And we've got to get to this place where we believe the Word of God because it is the Word of God and that's it. I can't say that I believe in healing because that is a doctrine of this church. I have to believe in healing because the Bible says by His stripes I am healed. I can't begin to believe on things because I can't live on your faith. And that's why in the body of Christ, man, I'm not getting on to anybody. I'm really not. Man, God's been speaking and ministering to me on this. But listen, man, can I tell you why the word works for some people and it doesn't work for others? Because some people are doers of the word and believe the word and others don't. Others are professors and some are believers. And so the Bible says here that we've got to get in the word. And when you get in the word, it's like a mirror. It's going to show me who I really am. Man, the Word is constantly changing me. I'm never going to have it all together until I'm with Him face to face. I'm always going to have areas for improvement. I'm always going to have areas that I can get better. I'm always going to have areas where I can grow. How dare I think I've arrived and quit working for the kingdom? How dare I stand back and act like it's someone else's job to do this or that? Because we treat Christianity and church membership like they're jobs. Like their jobs and positions instead of ministries and callings because we're so focused on me and not focused on others that it becomes a job and how am I going to get promoted and how am I going to get a platform and how am I going to get a microphone and how's my name going to be there? And let me tell you, man, those thoughts come all the time. Man, I, I saw the way they looked at you. Man, you, it's hard to tell what they're thinking about you. They ain't thinking nothing about you, but you just received that thought down into you, so now you're mad at them. Now there's friction between you two that wasn't ever there to begin with because you placed it there. Now the Bible says this, in the last verse in 2 Corinthians, it says this. It says that the Word of God, we don't fight against people. We don't fight against flesh. We don't fight against church members. We don't fight against stuff right we ain't fighting against the government we ain't fighting against the president we ain't fighting against people we're fighting a spiritual battle in our minds we are fighting a spiritual battle in our minds that has already been won and victorious for you and I right but the Bible says that we are able to pull down these strongholds that have developed in our mind man that's why my goodness man that's why you keep falling over that same sin It's because you haven't renewed your mind. That's why you're still bound to that same habit. That's why you're still talking about that. That's why that person passed away 20 years ago and you can't ever even, you hate to get out of bed today. No joy, no peace, no hope in your life. Man, I'm not being mean. I'm telling you the truth. Man, it's because you've allowed that thought to to take you captive. And as your thought takes you captive, It develops a stronghold, a fortress, an unpenetrable wall that nothing can get into. So you may be prosperous in your finances and in your body, but man, you're living miserable with no joy, no peace, and no hope. You may have joy, peace, and hope, but you're broke as a joke, and you're sick all the time. And these are things God promised us. I'm not saying we ain't going to go through things. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but it also says He delivered me out of them all. (laughs) And so the Word of God here says strongholds are developed based on our thought life. Are you with me? But I love this part. The Bible says that when this thought comes, this is our responsibility. This is how we change things. Very important. Last thing I'm going to say. We've got to take that thought and we hold that thought captive. That thought cannot hold me captive Every time a thought comes in my mind, I should take that thought and arrest it. Hold it captive and judge that spirit that's behind it. And if it's a spirit that's telling me to run around on my wife, that ain't of God. I take that thought and I hold it captive. And when I hold, what happens when someone gets arrested? They're taken before a judge and they're accused of whether they're guilty or they're not guilty. The Bible tells us here to take every thought that tries to rise up in your mind and change your situation. Every single thought, grab it, arrest it, take it captive, and put it on trial right there. Who's the judge? The Word. (laughs) 
So when, when, when you get that bad report from the doctor, man, and, and at times we all get, have, a, have had a bad report. So the bad report comes, and immediately the thought begins to come in your mind. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die. My daddy and my granddaddy had it. I'm never going to make it past this. Those thoughts begin to come. And when that thought comes, you've got to grab hold of that thought and say, wait a second, that's not of God. God doesn't curse me. God wants me to have long life and be proud. I am placing judgment on that thought, and I am commanding you on the authority of the Word of God and in the name of Jesus Christ to leave my mind now. And you can only do that if you've got the Word on the inside of you because you've got to replace that thought and say, my standard for thinking and living today is that by His stripes I am healed. My standard of living today is that I am blessed and not cursed. My standard of living today is that I've been blessed in all spirit, with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. You've got to take your thought life and arrest your thoughts, man. I wish there were an easier way to do it, but there's not. There's not an easier way to do this. You've got to reprogram and rethink your mind. But I promise you that if you do, if you'll take the Word of God and you'll change your mind to begin to get in that and begin to meditate on that, it'll begin to bubble up. Joyce Meyer said this, she got saved and she was still a smoker. I'm not going against smoking, I'm telling you a story. She was still a smoker when Joyce Meyer first got saved. She didn't want to smoke, she was convicted of it. So Joyce Meyer began every day to get a, to, to get a scripture, and every day she said, I'd be driving down the road puffing on the cigarette, saying, I hate these things in the name of Jesus. I've been set free in the name of Jesus from this addiction. Every day, man, she's still smoking, right? She's smoking and making that her confession. She said it took her about two weeks, but one day she woke up and just had no desire anymore. This is someone who got saved, but their soul was still the old soul. Their habit was still the old habit. Their action was still the old action. Their emotion was still the old emotion. What did she do? She didn't wave a magic wand. She began to speak the word to that situation over and over and over. And can I tell you, it wasn't just that somehow the power of the word caught up with what she was saying. It was somehow she began to say it one time, and she believed it. And when she finally heard what she was saying, and she believed it, out of her heart, her mouth spoke. And when her mouth began to speak the word of God out of her heart full of faith and belief, the word instantly was activated in her life. Amen. That's how it still works for you. And I stand to your feet this evening. Listen, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, we want to open up the altar and uh, give you an opportunity to come and accept him uh, as your Lord and Savior. Listen, you can never be good enough to earn his grace and earn his mercy and earn his forgiveness. Jesus Christ himself became sin for you and I. He went to a cross and suffered the penalty for you. And he has given you and I an opportunity to become one with the Father through the sacrifice of his Son. Amen. If you're here and you need special prayer, we invite you to come up for that as well. But I'm going to ask you tonight, as we sing a song, for you just to meditate and begin to search out your own heart. Because I think this is good for all of us. Amen. It's good to really begin to listen to your mind and hear what you've been thinking. And man, evaluate your life. Look at your life, man. If, if there's an area of your life that's not lining up with the Word of God, you can trace it all the way back to your thought life. There may be, have been some, some, some bad teaching in your life, some bad church in your life, some bad people in your life, and, and I'm sorry that you had to go through that. But listen, God is good and God is faithful. So you've got to begin to point your direction, your attention back to the Word of God. You've got to let the power of the Word of God change your situation. And if you stick with the Word, I'll tell you this. I'm not one of those guys that will say this. Well, what if the Word doesn't work? The Word always works. The Word always works. It's forever settled in heaven. It's a closed book issue. Amen. So as we sing a song this evening, evaluate your heart. If you need special prayer, if you want to receive Jesus as your Savior, we invite you as well.
the song of all songs dance Oh 